Hello, my name is Justin Tyler. Today's date is November 23rd, 2009. I am interviewing, uh, interviewing Alfredo Marin Carl of Ball State at Ball State University about his experience in the military during the Vietnam era. Could you please say and spell your name? Uh, A-L-F-R-E-D-O, Alfredo. And the last name is M-A-R-I-N, Marin, C-A-R-L-E, Carle. When and where were you born? Born in New York City, August 9th, 1949. Did you grow up here? Uh, no, I grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Well, I went to, uh, from New York to Puerto Rico when I was about 11 years old, <clears throat> and then I was there until I was drafted, and I was actually drafted from Puerto Rico. Uh, how and does the draft with Puerto Rico um, work exactly? We're American citizens, so you have, we have to fight the wars too, even though we, don't, we can't vote for the president. What was it like growing up in Puerto Rico? Uh, growing up in Puerto Rico was, uh, you know, very family-oriented, uh, just you know, very ethnic, um, great food, great weather. Um, uh, I had a, a really wonderful childhood, even though my parents were divorced when I was, you know, in New York City when I was about seven years old. So I grew up with my mother and my two sisters. Um, I went to school there, went to high school for... Uh, four years, even though I didn't graduate from high school in Puerto Rico, I dropped out, and that's why, obviously, that's why I got drafted. Or I actually, I actually joined the draft because uh, I knew I was going to get drafted anyway. So I thought if I joined the draft, I might get, you know, I might get a better deal, you know, like being a cook or I don't know something that wasn't combat related, even though that's not the way it happened. So you were uh, born in the United States, and then you lived in Puerto Rico with your mom. Um, where yeah. was your father? Well, he moved to Puerto Rico too, but uh, he was, he remarried and had another family. What were your views on war prior to enlistment? Excuse me. What were your views on war prior to enlistment? Uh, well, I was totally against the war. Um, um, I've always been um, nonviolent. Uh, you know, I don't think I maybe I got into too. too Fifth fights in my life when I was a kid, you know, maybe at the most. Uh, even though I had an older brother who was fighting all the time, <laughs> and actually he joined the army. I mean, he he went volunteered, and they turned him down. <laughs> he was then he's the guy who's into guns and all that stuff. You know, he's a hunter and all in Puerto Rico and very GI, you know. And and he wanted to go and they didn't take him. I didn't want to go and they took me. <laughs> Was there any particular reason you dropped out of high school? Um, yeah, I just you know got tired of the whole thing and I uh, wanted to make money and you know and have fun. Um, so um, I just you know stupid kid thing you know you just think that uh, you can do better you know I guess. And I never thought I was college material, so I didn't think, you know, I thought to myself, well, this is useless, why so just go out and get a job. Going back to your enlistment, how and when did you enter, enter military service? Um, I entered military service uh, on, well, in 1969. I think, I don't know exactly what date it was, so I think it's in those papers somewhere. Because uh, I looked all that up on my, uh, you know, all the, I don't know, all my uh, records, but uh, I know it was in 1969, and uh, I don't know, it was January, maybe, I don't know, uh, and in San Juan, uh, and I, uh, there was uh, the federal building down San, in old San Juan. Uh, it was, you know, quite an experience, you know, just went in there, did uh, all the you know, all the physical and all that, and then you came back and uh, you, you swore, and they were really, really nice to you, and you're walking in, and you, you, as soon as you put your hand up and say, you know, I, I pledge allegiance or whatever it is that you say, and then they scream out, gentlemen, now you are soldiers, or you're, you know, GI. And uh, I would remember <laughs> these doors opened, and right there, there was a bunch of mops and buckets, and they started, you know, okay, now you guys got to clean this floor. I was like, right away, we started cleaning and mopping, you know, two seconds after being inducted or whatever you call it, you know.
uh, what branch were you in and what units did you serve in? When I, uh, I was sent first to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and uh, did I, I did my uh, basic training in Fort Jackson. <clears throat> and then uh, after uh, the basic training, I got my orders, which, for, which was for 11 Hotel. Uh, which was, you know, uh, the recoilless rifles, which are, you know, anything that starts with an 11 in front of it, it's bad news. 11 Bravo, 11 Alpha, 11 Charlie, 11 Hotel. Any of those um, have to do with combat. And uh, so when I first got my orders and I went up to my, you know, platoon sergeant and I said, so what does this mean? And he said, basically, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't use those words, but, but you know. And I said, what are you, and so, yes, yeah, you know, that's a combat MOS. So, I, well, you know, I was pretty upset. It was like, I was 19 years old. You know. So I called my, my mother up, and, you know, actually, there was a, one of my memories. There's a line of telephones, you know, you know, public telephones. And everybody was calling up their parents, and, you know, their every, in every booth, everybody who had, and then more similar to mine was crying. <laughs> oh, mom, I am going to the war. You know, that kind of stuff. Well, it was the first news, you know. You know, a you 19-year-old know, kid. Then after that, um, I, got, I went to AIT, or Advanced Infantry Training, right there in the same fort, Fort Benning, I mean Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And then I did my training there uh, for Advanced Infantry Training. And then after that, um, uh, uh, just before I was graduating from the advanced infantry training uh, program, they asked me uh, if I wanted to participate in the um, non-commissioned non officers program in Fort Benning, Georgia. And my platoon sergeant had picked me as one of the, as a squad leader, he had picked me as a person to go to this program. I guess I got lucky, if you want to call it that. And uh, because when I, I, you know, when I, when I, you know, and I think of this is part of the, my own philosophy in life. Anytime you are in some kind of situation, you know, the best thing to do, is my opinion, to make the best out of it. You know, so, you know, I was, in, I was going to be a soldier, and I'm, I'm going to get shot at, and might as well learn how to defend myself. You know, so I, when I did my rifle training and all that, I, you know, I shot expert. Uh, well, you know, got medals for shooting expert, shoot, you know, sharpshooter, or whatever they used to call it, expert rifleman. And uh, and I did all, you know, I did everything they told me to do, and, and I tried to do the best I can. So I got, so I got into the program at NCO school, I commissioned officer school, and that was in Fort Benning, Georgia. Another thing that I liked about that was the fact that it would keep me home for another six months. The training was well for actually for another year. It would keep me away from the war for another year. So I thought maybe the war because there was already talks at that time about the I was starting to pull troops from you know from out of Vietnam. So <clears throat> um, that was my con my idea was you know maybe they would stop the war while I was still in training, which didn't happen. But that's that was I that's what I thought to do. Was there anything back home that was wanting that made you want to stay home a little longer besides not wanting to go to the war, like a girlfriend or something? Well, I had a girlfriend, yeah, and actually she, she became my first wife. That was weird because um, while I was in training, um, and, and when I was in NCO school, we broke up. You know, she sent me a Dear John letter, like, you know, a lot of soldiers get Dear John letters. So I got a Dear John letter, and I, oh man, blah, 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 you know, so I got over it. Uh, and then after, just about when my training was going to end, uh, she sent me another letter. Actually, she even called my my company from Puerto Rico. And, you know, I was in the middle of the training, something, somebody's calling you from Puerto Rico, it's an emergency or something, and I'm going, oh, crap, you know. So I went up to the, you know, to the, the office or the CEO, CEO's office or whatever and I picked up the phone and it was her and she was crying and she said, I really, really want to marry you well, let's get married and I said, well, you know when you're in the army you're 
pretty much a sucker for all that kind of stuff. He's so lonely and all that. So I said, sure, well, you know. <laughs> it was probably the biggest mistake of my life, or one of them at least. How long were you married to her? Seven years. Did you have any children? No. Uh, you had mentioned on your information Woods. sheet uh, huh? the 9th Infantry Division and the 25th Infantry Division. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, when I, after I was uh, in NCO school, then then after that, after my training in NCO school, they sent me to Fort, uh, uh, Fort Polk in Louisiana. And it was in a, a town called Leesville, uh, which we used to call Sleesville. And the, we used to call Fort Polk, Fort Puke, Louisiana. <laughs> it was terrible. And that's where they did major training for, or one of the places they did major training for Vietnam. So they had like, you know, all these Vietnam huts set up and, you know, situations. And I was one of the, that was uh, the third or the second phase of my training. It was, and then the third phase was obviously being in Vietnam um, the, with, the, with the real bullets flying. Uh, yeah. So after that, uh, I got sent to, you know, I got my orders for Vietnam, and uh, I shipped out of uh, um, Oakland Air Force Base. And uh, we, from Oakland Air Force Base, we went to Japan, and then from Japan to Vietnam. Um, and that was sort of an interesting experience, too. Uh, being in a an Oakland Air Force Base, uh, there was these huge, like, plane hangars. That, that's where they had all the soldiers, and there was, like, hundreds if not thousands of soldiers um, waiting for their plane to come in to go to Vietnam and uh, and, the, and we were transported in those days we already started doing the transport in you know, commercial airlines so you know it was like an American airline that I went to Vietnam in. Um, um, all I remember all the this well what they would do is that they you they assign you a bunk and you just you know pick a bunk and and there was these you know hundreds if not like thousands of bunks and, and then you'd have uh, every morning or every not every morning but every like four or five hours they would have a roll call and you had to go and then they started calling out names you know yo blow la da la you know la 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 and then you're you're gonna leave it this time. And the rest was dismissed until your, you know, until your time came up. So I was there about a day, maybe a day and a half, and then, you know, finally my name got called and they put me on a plane and we went to Vietnam. Uh, I remember you know, one of the things I remember was that all the stewardess at those days they called them stewardess, uh, not flight attendants like today. But, you know, all the stewardess were these. Uh, how can I say this nicely? Long in the tooth <laughs> women. <laughs> like, you know, there are women like in their 50s, 60s, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know why that was the case, but, but uh, and it was a very, very somber flight. I remember um, you could hear pin drop, you know, uh, most of the time. Then, we got to Japan and uh, we got out, just sort of stretch our legs a little bit. And there was a PX there, and people bought stuff and blah blah blah. We got back on the airplane, and then we landed. It was uh, like a 22-hour total, 22-hour flight to Vietnam. You said uh, that the flight there was really somber. Uh, what were some of the things that were going through your mind? Well, you know, it's all that expectation. I mean, you, you don't know anything about Vietnam. You don't know. You know, especially a 19-year-old boy. Uh, well, by that time I was 20 already, so you know, 20-year-old kid going into a war zone, and uh, and you've of course you've been trained for all this stuff, but you don't know what to expect. You don't even know, I mean, where you're landing or where you're going. They don't tell you anything, you know. So there's a lot of things going through your mind. I mean, a lot of things. Am I, you know, am I going to make it out of this? Uh, you know, wonder what this is all about. You know, you hear about all the casualties. You hear about, all, you know, you hear all the bad news uh, on, on on TV and and uh, and actually on uh, 
when people are coming back, you know, when you're on some of these uh, forts, a lot of the uh, uh, lifers, we used to call people who, you know, do their, that, that's their career. They come back, they go, and they talk about things happening, whatever. So, you know, you're pretty much um, scared. And then when we got there, it was funny, uh, we landed, and of course they used the same plane, the same exact plane, that you get off, the other guys that are leaving are like, getting on and going. So that was uh, another, this was in Benoit, an uh, Air Force base. Uh, in Benoit, when we landed in Benoit, it must have been, I don't know, mid, mid morning or something, I don't remember exactly, but it was daytime. And uh, I remember this, this, you know, funny things you remember. Like I remember when we landed, we got off the plane, we get into this big, you know, receiving, you know, place, whatever, you know. Uh, and we walked in, all the guys that were you know, coming in new, of course, all our uniforms or, or fatigues were like brand new and green and our boots are shined and that kind of stuff. And all the chairs were, I don't remember if they were, I know that some of the chairs were, the chairs that, were facing towards the inside of the building for the people who just got there were green and all the chairs and it was just like a, this little divider you know like they have like a rope thing divider and on the other side were all the same troops that were coming into uh, or or leaving the country they're going to get on the same plane that you just they everybody's calling them their freedom bird that was the word the freedom bird and uh the guys on that side, you know, they all, when they saw us coming off the airplane, and they just started hackling us and screaming. And I remember one, one this thing, one situation, or not situation, one, one guy, who was a Puerto Rican guy, who said uh, he's, he sort of screamed at the time, on top of his his, his voice. Uh, are there any Puerto Ricans over there? You know, in the batch, and you know, several. Yeah, yeah. He was talking. The guy's gonna be trying to be nice, and then he goes over and says, "You're," you know, <laughs> you're like, "Wow, thanks a lot, buddy." <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, then then we sat down and we just waited. You know, everything's waiting and waiting and waiting until. Some person showed up and started, you know, saying, okay, now this is what we're going to do. We're going to get on this bus, and then we're going to take you to this other place. Uh, so we got on the bus. And I remember on the bus they had those uh, screens where, you know, to maybe stop anybody from putting a grenade inside of there. You know, all the windows were like bars. There were screens. So that that alone, like, impresses you. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know. Anyway. So they took us to this place, and then we're there, and then the guy says, uh, this big call, is, and the first thing, this colonel comes out and says, and he says, everybody okay, sit down and relax. You're, you're not dead, okay? <laughs> you're not dead. You're, this is, you know, Benoit, this is a huge base. This is like being in Fort Benning, Georgia. There's no danger here. Just calm down. Everything's going to be okay, you know, so... Then they started doing the roll call thing every day, uh, where, you know, for a couple of days. So you get your assignments. So uh, you would line up, and then they would say, okay, Joe Blow, you're going up to, you know, 1st Cavalry Division, or going up to, you know, 25th Infantry Division, or you're going up to, so mine was, you know, the 9th Infantry Division in, in um, Tan An, south of Saigon. What exactly was the 9th Infantry Division? Well, it was one of the infantry divisions. It was their, their, their specialty was Mekong Delta. So we worked in the Mekong Delta south of Saigon, which was... Um, <clears throat> the, there wasn't, at that time, already the action has started to not be as bad as, say, way up north. You know, we had uh, not as many... We didn't run into as many Viet Cong or... Or actually, we didn't run in. We ran into Viet Cong more than we did Arvin. Arvin more was more concentrated Central Highlands and the northern part of the country. So we had VC in in in, in uh, Mekong Delta, 
And the, the, the worst thing about working in the Mekong Delta wasn't the enemy itself. It was just the miserable, you know, the miserable terrain to work in. It was a miserable country, a miserable terrain. You know, like you worked in rice paddies. So and you didn't walk on the rice paddy dikes because that's where, where they would put all the booby traps and all that. So you would, you know, the point guy would just check out the dike and make sure there was, and then we'd go over that dike and walk and walk the water. So we walk in mud up to your knees and sometimes water up to your chest and sometimes water up to your neck, depending on how deep the dike was. And uh, and then we slept in that water. So we were in, you know, we were, you know, some of our missions were no more than seven days because our bodies couldn't take, especially in monsoon, our bodies couldn't take the water. I mean, you have to... You have you know how you get in a, in a bathtub and you lay for an hour in a bathtub? What does your body look like? It's all wrinkled up, all shriveled up. Well, imagine being seven days in water. And then you had the, you know, ringworm and leeches and, and billions of mosquitoes and bugs and the heat. And it was just, you know, pure misery. Do you recall a time where you, where you were ever sick? Of some of the things you, were you know, doing. I never got sick in Vietnam. Never. The only thing I had once was um, I had something wrong with a tooth, and I went in to a dentist, you know, a military dentist, and they fixed my tooth, and they just said, well, this is temporary. The guy was a jerk. I would just put something temporary. It'll last, you know, a year at the most, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, we don't want to spend any money on you. Grunts, you know. Who knows when you can get killed or something like that. Something stupid like that. But thanks, thanks a lot, you know. But anyway, so that was the end. I was gone for a couple of days for that. And that was, uh, I had a friend, though, who had malaria five times. He got malaria five times. A uh, little Puerto Rican guy, a friend of mine. And he finally, after the fifth time he got malaria, fifth time, then they pulled him out for, you know, permanently. Um, just sort of a general question. What's the difference between an infantry division and the cavalry division? Nothing. The uh, the infantry division, they're all infantry division. They said they call it the 1st Cavalry Division because of their history. They come from, you know, related to the 1st Cavalry or the cavalry and back, you know, way back when. You know, Rough Riders and uh, Gary Owen and, and all those guys, you know, way back. Um, Actually, I think I was, when I got transferred later on to the 1st Cavalry, I think I was in the same uh, division or the same unit that uh, uh, Gary Owen was. Uh, Gary Owen was one of the guys, you know, with, uh, what's his name, um, uh, got massacred by the Indians. Uh, what was his name? You know, uh, that Little Bighorn or what was that? Uh, who? Uh, Oh, Custer, yes, right, Custer. So I, I was in that same division that Custer was or something. But that was later on. But the difference of the cavalry it, it was that the cavalry, of course, they don't have any horses. Their horses were helicopters in Vietnam. So every, we were transported everywhere in helicopters. And, and that's true, too. Uh, their, their unit was, was called Air Mobile. That's what their... The first cavalry was they were air mobile, so everything was air mobile. They pick up you, to pick you up and take you somewhere else in a chopper, drop you off. You work that area, they pick you up and take you somewhere else. But that was like the third division I was in. So going back to the first to twenty uh, fifth infantry division, we were like I said, we were just working in the Mekong Delta, and it was ridiculous because I was in a mortar platoon. You know, I was a, uh, since I was a sergeant, I was a, a mortar platoon. Um, and I was a squad leader, and I was the guy who did all the calculations, even though I was terrible at math. <laughs> that was fun. we used slide rulers and that kind of stuff. And so you know, I was doing all the, you know, the, the azimuth and height and, and whatever, putting all the, you know, calculating the, you know, the trajectory and all that to to fire these things and and. Uh, and then the guys who would fire these things would put them on the dikes, the, this huge plate where the mortar goes on, and you, know, you drop the mortar in them. But you know, by the second mortar you dropped, the the plate was sunk in the water, and so all calculations were off. Everything was you know, 
it was just really terrible. It wasn't really that effective. So all I, I, I try to calculate, you know, I try to give a couple of clicks. That's a thousand, uh, a thousand meters, I think. A couple of clicks over where they, they would say the enemy was, just in case uh, I, I didn't want to hit our own people. So then we, you know, from there, then you would drop, drop, drop until you would reach the enemy if they were there by that time. Usually by the time you stopped dropping, they knew what was coming and they were gone. But <clears throat> that was that was my job. Um, going back, before you actually arrived in Vietnam, what were your expectations of what the country itself would be like and the people there? Well, actually, um, I didn't have much expectations, you know. I didn't know much about the people. I didn't know, you know, um, I heard a lot of bad talk about the people because, you know, uh, you know, uh, basically ignorance, I would imagine. Once I got there and I and I met the people, I saw they were just people, man, you know. I felt like, you know, they were just normal, really nice people that were just, you know, in the, caught in the middle of this horrible war. Uh, the other thing that was... Um, that was for me was normal was that the climate was pretty close to Puerto Rico. You know, it was all in the eighties, the nineties, never in the hundreds degrees, but very, very, very humid and Puerto Rico's like that. Very, very, very humid. So, you know, all the GI you know, and then I was like, Hey, this is you know, this is home weather, you know. It wasn't the only miserable part was the fact that you couldn't take a shower every day, which when I even when I lived in Puerto Rico I took two showers a day because, you know, of the heat. Obviously, no showers. All right, so uh, you, obviously, you volunteered. What what did you think of some of the people? Who Joined the draft, <laughs> which is volunteering. But sounds a little bit better. Um, but, some of the people who tried to dodge the draft, what, like what were your feelings towards them, the people who tried to get out of the Hey, draft? more power to them. I didn't feel that they were anti-patriotic or anything like that. That was, you know, um, the war, you know, and now even, you know, obviously I even have even stronger feelings now about war, being a veteran and, and you know, and seeing the horrors and, 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 and the fact that wars that don't actually have no, you know, um, consequences on any, conflict really I mean it just make things worse in my opinion and uh, you know war is throughout humanity hasn't really solved anything I mean, it just gets worse um, so you know when I about the draft dodgers I you know I said you know if you, and if you if that's your conscience and that's what you want to do you know more power to you I never, I didn't I didn't d judge them either way. Let's put it that way. I didn't say they were anti-patriotic. I didn't feel resentment because I was in the army and they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Um, you know, they were a lot of people were conscious objectors. You know, conscious. How do you say that? Conscious objectors that they didn't they didn't want to kill anything, and I can understand that. Right now, being being the person that I'm leaning toward in my life right now, Buddhism. Uh, I'm trying to be a Buddhist and ph philosophically speaking, you know, not, not trying to kill anything and all that. So that, you know, I, I, that even makes more sense now to me than, than it did then. What exactly are your ties with Buddhism? Um, <clears throat> well, I started doing researching and getting an interest in Buddhism about, about five or six years ago. And uh, the, I have read... Um, you know, a handful of books, let's put it that way, you know, 10, 15, 20 books on the subject and and, um, and the life of the Buddha and uh, and, uh, um, and and Tibetan Buddhism philosophy and, and that kind of stuff. And it's really just blown me away. It's, just, it's really enlightening, <laughs> not to use the word as <laughs> a pun, but it really is uh, fascinating. It really especially meditation, and I'm a very hyper person, uh, well, I have been very hyper, I'm very, um, um, uh, I want it and I want it now, you know, kind of person, uh, 
So this has helped me. And I have a little bit of ADHD too, so so it's really helped me to get more centered and uh, uh, make better judgments. Um, not be so impatient about like waiting in lines or doing things that. Uh, Actually, even my artwork, my fine artwork has changed. I used to do a lot of abstract expressionist type of direct work. And now I'm doing this really meticulous, tedious uh, work that my wife even says, you know, where in the hell is that coming from? And you know, she never experienced me as being, you know, that patient on, on, work, on stuff that I'm doing. And so that's been enlightening, too. Are there any ties between Buddhism and your experience in Vietnam? Actually, uh, I didn't know that at the time, but now that I look back, uh, I remember there's this one, Nick Tang, Tang Hang, I think it's the name of the author, and he's a, he's a Buddhist monk that was in Vietnam at the same time that I was in Vietnam. And uh, one of his books, uh, he talks about being in Vietnam with uh, as a monk and walking down a row with another monk and and then uh, talking uh, mentioning that this this convoy of American GIs went by them and one one uh, one American soldier spit on you know they call them names and spit on this other monk not him but this other monk and the guy got furious and was about to hang up his his robes to go join the VC. He wanted just to go out and kill Americans because he thought he, they, you know, they were despicable for what they had done to him, blah, blah, blah. And Nick, and Thich Nhat Hanh convinced him that, you know, that guy in the truck, in that convoy, that American soldier is going through the same frustrations that you are. You know, he doesn't want to be here. He was drafted. He hates our country because it, to him it represents a war and, and killing and violence and all that. Sort of the same thing that it represents to you, you know. And just on the on the other side of the coin. It's the same coin, basically, the, but on the other side of the coin. So and have a little compassion for that guy. And the, the monk, he convinced the monk and the monk went on to, you know, keep doing his peace work. And Thich Nhat Hanh has written a lot of books about his experience of growing up or being in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And he's, you know, he, he, he travels all over the world. He's established himself in the United States and in, and in Europe um, and uh, for peace, you know, he's one of those guys. So there was a tie there even, you know, like I've always been impressed by Asian philosophy, and even though I didn't know that much at that time, but later on when I went to college, I did all my art history, uh, all my art history courses. I did them in, in Asian studies in Asian, in the Chinese art and Japanese art, and so on. You talked a little bit about the mortars that you worked with. Mm -hmm. What about the recoilless rifles? Never used a recoilless rifle in Vietnam just in training when I was in AITS the first and last time I ever saw them. They were just big and noisy, Listen, that's all I remember. Were you familiar with any weapon use prior to your service? Have were you I, familiar with any, any weapon use prior to your service? Do you mean like, did I have any guns when I was have a kid? <laughs> uh, my brother had a gun, but that was, I, you know, I, I probably held it in my hand, but I never sh shot it or anything like that. What was it like firing a gun or a weapon for the first time then? Um, it was kind of thrilling, you know. It's, you know, it's, it's like, wow, this is powerful. But, you know, you're a kid. You're like, you know, it's like, you know, like when you're a kid playing the Cowboys and Indians. Except that when you go to the war, then the bullets start coming in the other direction. Then that's a lot different when you're getting shot at than when you're shooting a weapon. That's why all these people who are like gun advocates and who have never been to a war. You know, I am very much pro gun control, especially, you know, AK 47s. And I mean, uh, you know, the weapons uh, that are useless. I mean, in terms of the only, their only use is to, is to kill. I mean, it's to, it's a massive destruction. 
mean, if you want a shotgun to go out and hunt something or, a, you know, a rifle to do hunting or, you know, or a pistol to defend yourself in your house, that's fine. I mean, you know, I guess it's part of our the men or our rights, right, you know, to bear arms. Uh, but, you know, AK-47s and Uzis and, you know, uh, A1 machine guns, mortars. I mean, like people have, uh, what do you call those? Um, bazookas. Jesus. What do you need those for? Yeah. Uh, would you say that a lot of your duties in Vietnam are stressful? This, no, actually, the stress only comes when you have to go out in the field. Once you're back, you know, in, not in the field, and you're on fire base or something, stress is gone. I mean, all you do there is just, you know, pull some guard duty, maybe a little bit. Um, and then the rest of the time, you're, you know, drinking beer and smoking dope and, you know, having a good old time with your buddies, playing cards, whatever. What would you say you use as motivation in order to to not be so stressed going out into the field? Uh, your motivation to actually go out from day to day and whenever? Um, that's a good question. I don't recall using anything. It was just like a job. This is, you know, I got to do this. We go out there and and did a lot of praying, you know, hope nothing happens and hope, you know. I really got lucky in Vietnam. You know, that's the, my main, my, the big story for me was that every time I was in some kind of harm's way, for some reason I got pulled out of that harm's way. You know, you call it whatever you want, divine intervention, my angel, you know, I don't, I don't know what it was. But I recall that every time I was going to be put in the worst of harm's way, something happened that I was out of that. I didn't, it didn't happen to me. Uh, for example, when I when I was pulled out of the when I was in the Ninth Infantry Division, uh, my uh, my my division was being pulled out. They were going home with the colors, what they called, and I think they were I don't know where exactly they were being sent, but you know, so whoever had enough time in country would be pulled out with the colors. Enough time in country meant seven, I mean, it meant uh, ten months. I only had six. So I got sent to another division, which was the 25th Infantry Division. So when I got to the 25th Infantry Division, actually I was in Cambodia with, uh, with the 9th Infantry Division, so that was the, the worst uh, experience probably was when, when we went to Cambodia and doing a camp. When Nixon sent everybody across the border to Cambodia to destroy the Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh Trail that came down from northern Vietnam uh, on the Cambodian side. And that's where they uh, would infiltrate all weapons and all that kind of stuff to supply the Viet Cong the East and the north, uh, north of Vietnam, North Vietnamese Army, the NBA. So, that was my worst experience in combat was when we went to you know to uh, with the 20 with the, excuse me with the 9th infantry division then when we came back uh then that, that's when they were starting to pull out and then I got redeployed or re, you know reassigned to um the 25th infantry division in Kuchi and there as I was waiting uh my orders to to see what battalion I was going to go when I first got to division headquarters. Uh, I ran into my first cousin. That was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. This is the son of my aunt, my father's sister. Except that they lived in New York City at the time, or New York, and I lived in Puerto Rico. So I didn't know he was drafted. He didn't know I was in the Army. and. We just ran into each other in Vietnam. That was an incredible experience. We were at, they had these little, like, uh, like a, what do you call those, uh, little trailer, a hut, 
I don't know, that was like a snack bar, and they, you know, make hot dogs, hamburgers, whatever. And then they had a couple of tables outside, you know, like Bob, uh, picnic tables. And then we got, uh, I went up and got a hamburger or something, and I sat down, and he, and I didn't, and he got up, and oh, he was there, got, and he sat right in front of me, on the same table. And he's like, what do you, oh my God, Danny? He called me Freddie, and I was like, Freddie, Danny, oh my God. So we just, you know, we were wild. You know, we, you know, we were, we grew up together in New York, but then we split when I went to Puerto Rico. And, and I'd seen him maybe once in New York, but I, I didn't know he was in the Army. He didn't know I was in New York. So we ran into each other, first cuts. So we went crazy for three days. You know, we just, you know, smoking dope, drinking, you know, rum and coke, whatever. We just went. I was a sergeant, though, and he was still a PFC because he'd been busted a couple of times. <laughs> he had a rough time. He had a rough time with Vietnam. And uh, that's one of the things also that I, my experience, I made it into something positive. He, on the other hand, made it into something negative and uh, it destroyed his life. He died at the age of 53, an overdose in California somewhere. So his whole life was just a mess. Do you think that a lot of the problems that he had were because of what he experienced in Vietnam? Well, I think a lot of the problems that every soldier had in Vietnam has to do with their experience in Vietnam, but it also has to do with their their own personality. You know, I've, I've you know, you go to these, and I've never been to one of the, you know all these rallies of Vietnam veterans. And, you know, I've run, talked to some Vietnam veterans and, you know, um, they made that their whole life. You know, they, Vietnam destroyed their life to them or they got their leg blown off or their, you know, their brain, you know, got messed up on drugs or whatever their, I mean, you know, it's a terrible thing to get your leg blown off, you know, or you get, you know, whatever, missing a limb or something. But then that's it. You know, they, they stopped their life right there. So they picked up their pension, you know, they stopped their life, and then everything has revolves is around, the rest of their life revolves around the misery of the war and, and looking up friends and MIA and POW and that kind of stuff. And, and they concentrate on that, and their life is destroyed forever. I mean, I think part of it is, yeah, the war is terrible and it did this to you, but it also has to do with your own personality. It has to do with what you do with what, it's handed to you, you know. So my cousin, we were handed the same thing. He did, you know, something. To, you know, I made he made junk out of it. I made something positive out of it. You know, I used the GI Bill when I got back to go back to school. Finish. I didn't even finish high school. Then I went back to finish high school, and then I got, I you know, I studied to do the you know, college entrance boards and. Got into college and then, you know, did something with my life. And that was my attitude in Vietnam. I, you know, I would pray every time. God, if you can get me out of this mess, I promise I'm going to turn my life around, you know. And it happens, you know. Because of your, um, your involvement in Vietnam, would you say that you ever uh, suffered any post-traumatic stress disorder, even if it was just minor symptoms such as problems sleeping or anything? Yeah, well, of course, when I first came back, you know, first couple of years, you know, you hear a firecracker go up and you're like, what, you know? <laughs> you know, I mean, I should remember just coming back from Vietnam and, uh, you know, we were driving down, my wife at the time and I was driving down um, in San Juan, we were driving down the road and, um, and in old San Juan there was, there was a carnival going on, or you know, so they had big fireworks or something, and I, I completely forgot about that. And the fireworks went on at 12 midnight, and we were just driving back home or something, or towards that one. And all, and all these fireworks go off, and you know, I just let the steering wheel go, and I jumped. She was, you know, and I jumped, you know, ducked into the car, and she was like grabbing her stick. What's the matter with you? And I'm like, oh, oh no, no. And then I got back out, and I was, you know, nothing. <laughs> You're just trying to cut, you know, take cover. You know, you're used to you hear something go off. <laughs> the first thing you do is hit the ground. Do you believe there are any long-term effects of it? I was. It was funny. Here's here's something really cool. When I was in Vietnam, I dreamed about being home. Right, 
I woke up into the nightmare. I woke up in the real nightmare, which was being in Vietnam. And when I went home, I dreamed about being in Vietnam. That was a nightmare. But when I woke up, I was home. And that was a blessing. So the worst nightmares were, were in, 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 uh, of Vietnam. The worst nightmares were in Vietnam. Drink, dreaming that I was home and wake up and I was in, in hell. That was the real, to me, the real bad stuff. You know what I'm saying? The, the bad dreams, where they were good dreams, but then you would wake up into this, into this terrible situation. Where when I had the nightmares in Vietnam, I would wake up and I'm going, oh, cool, I'm home. You know what I mean? So, no problem. Give me all the nightmares you want as long as I wake up at home. <laughs> um, going back a little bit to when you first got to Vietnam, what, what was your first mission and what were some of the things that were going through your head going into that first mission? Well, um, our, I don't remember distinctly. The, I mean, um, my first mission, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I did about five or ten missions before we were, ever ran into a firefight. So, you know, after five or ten missions, you go, eh, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> Until you run into your first firefight, and then you go, oh, crap. <laughs> but uh, um, that wasn't fun, obviously. Uh, the other thing about I mean, there was all these stories and all these things that happened that, you know, I can go on. You know, if you have 10 hours, I can tell you. But, you know, like, for example, I, I'm trying to talk, talking about being pulled out of the situations. Now, I went to, when I was transferred to the 25th Infantry Division, where I met my cousin, my friend, and my cousin, and I was assigned to this company, to this battalion. I don't remember the battalion, but it's, uh, I think it's in my paperwork there somewhere. I was assigned to this battalion, and I was assigned to this company in this battalion. And then uh, I reported to, you know, the first sergeant, and that company was out in the field. I think the Delta Company or something. They were out in the field on, on patrol. They were, you know, they were, they were doing their job. They were. And uh, so the sergeant said, well, they're, they're out, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you out there because they're supposed to be back in two or three days, so I'm not just going to send you out for two or three days. They're going to come back anyway. So just, he said, you'll go out with them the next time they go out. So I said, fine. So I threw my stuff in the, you know, in the, the, the bunk or whatever, and I went to the NCO club like everybody else does. So uh, then I'm in the NCO club, and I run into these Puerto Ricans. And that's what you do. The first thing you do is you look for your people, you know, looking at Gonzalez, Rodriguez, or whatever. And I met some of these guys, and we started drinking beers, and, you know, we were real friendly or whatever. So this one guy tells me, so um, who have you been assigned to? And I said, I'm with Delta Company. He says, guy wouldn't like that. He says, so oh, no. I said, what do you mean? No, no. He says, that's the, of all the companies, because he, he, work, he worked for the headquarters company. That's why he was there. Headquarters company always stays on base. All the, you know, all the other infantry companies go out. So he said, he said to me, of all the, you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta company, Delta is the one, their region where they work is the ones that are always getting hit by Charlie, always having casualty. Oh, obviously that's why they assigned me to that company because they were the, you know, they were sure leadership. You know, they needed, you know. So I'm going, oh my God. This is terrible, you know. So, well, what are you going to do? So we're talking that night, blah, 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 and, you know, drinking. And so we, we start talking about our lives in Puerto Rico. So, and he says, what, what did you do in Puerto Rico before you were in the Army? And I said, well, I was, you know, I was I'm in high school, but then I dropped out of high school. I started working in a TV station at, at night as a, as a, um, uh, scene designer or a set designer or set painter. They would do these, you know, and I would, because I've, I've always been talented about painting and doing design and all that. And uh, so my father was an artist and he still lives in Puerto Rico and you know, I grew up in an art family so I could do that kind of stuff. And uh, he said, you're an artist? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, you know, kind of. He says, you know what? I think our battalion draftsmen I said, what the hell is a battalion draftsman? 
you know, there's this guy who does all these charts and stuff for the colonel. You know, he just, that's what he does. He does charts and graphs or whatever, and these big cardboard, and, uh, you know, and then the colonel goes to the general and, okay, this is what we're doing, sir, is, uh, you know, blah, 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 to make presentations. You know, today would be PowerPoint stuff. You know, in those days it was, you know, on magic markers on cardboards, you know. So, and he says, do you know how to do that stuff? And I said, what? Are you crazy? I can do, I can paint circles around the, you know, I can do anything they want me to do. So he's, the guy said, well, let me see if I can get you an interview with the colonel. So he got me an interview with the colonel the next day or the day after. And I went up over to, and I reported to the colonel of the battalion, you know, commander. And he said, uh, well, yeah, this guy who's doing all my charts and graphs is ETS in it in two or three days. And he said, do you, you know how to do this stuff? And I said, yeah. He said, well, okay, let's give you a tip, you know. So he gave me, you know, a test, you know. He said, let's, I need this chart like this, that, da, da. So I went in there, and, I, man, I drew him a chart that he would never forget for the rest of his life. I mean, you know, 3D letters, you know, you name it. <laughs> I just did, I put my art into it. And the guy, oh, this is great. He changed my orders from Delta Company to Headquarters Company. So I spend, you know, I think it was two or three, four months. And I, no, two or three months because I still didn't have time in country. I still didn't have time in country when they, they pulled the 25th Division out. They pulled the 25th Division out and then they sent me to the 1st Cavalry Division. And when I went to the 1st Cavalry Division, of course, I was transferred out of a headquarters company. So they sent me to another headquarters company, even though this was in Tanan. Yeah, Tanan. This was like two miles from the Cambodian border. And they were getting hit all the time, too. But I wasn't out in the field. I was in a bunk with the colonel drawing little maps for him or whatever. So I lucked out on combat there, too. Brick, you or anyone you were ever close to wounded, even if it was... Yes, wasn't... Garcia, killed. I was a Mexican friend of mine, Garcia. When I was with... Uh, that's when I, we went to uh, Cambodia. Uh, he got killed. He got blown away. He stepped on a landmine. Right. Right. Time? Uh, this is Justin Tyler, and this is tape two of two with Alfredo Marin Carl at Ball State University and his experience with, in the military during the Vietnam era. Uh, getting back into our interview, you had just mentioned a buddy of yours named Garcia that was killed. In yes, the yes. He was, uh, well, actually, he was killed. Um, he stepped on a, a Claymore mine, a Viet, a Viet Cong Claymore mine. Uh, their equivalent of a, a Claymore mine which is a sort of a landmine. Uh, uh, actually, it's above ground mine. It's something that you have a trip wire and you walk over it and you just get blown away. So um, we were on a mission just going, in, in, I don't remember exactly, but we were in Cambodia and he was walking point. Uh, and unfortunately, he was the one that hit the, that was a bad thing about walking point. It's one of the, Things uh, you could uh, could happen to you. either. Usually, when you walk point, you walk. Uh, depending on the policies, whatever company you're with, we walked about 50 meters. The point man walked about 50 meters, 100 meters uh, ahead of everybody, um, and uh, and the reason was, you know checking things out, so if anybody got killed, it would be just him and not ten guys. I mean, sorry to say, but that's, you know, that's that's what point walking was all about. So he's, he ran into a landmine and he got blown away. Garcia. Uh, would you say that that had any effect on how careful you were out on the field? Well, I was pretty lucky because, again, I was in the heavy weapons platoon. So you have four rifle platoons, then you have a heavy weapons platoon, all right? And the heavy weapons platoon has to do with, like, the M30s and, uh, you know, and the mortars and, uh, uh, um, you know, all, all the other heavy weapons, you know, uh, um, where we, the 
the rifle platoons were the ones that walked point, or and then we were in the middle, so they were sort of we were sort of protected by them because uh, we would fire our stuff all over them. So you know, if they got into something, then we would start firing over them and then drop our fire to you know to kill the enemy. So we were in between them and the enemy always. You know. So there was a company in front of us, or I mean, uh, a platoon in front of us, or two platoons in front of us, and two platoons behind us, and then we were in the middle. Would you say there were ever any close calls where you were almost injured? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a firefight, um, and that's where I got my, I have a Bronze Star medal. I don't know if it's on there. And was be, we, we got ambushed. And uh, my lieutenant, um, uh, he was up sort of in the middle of the fire, uh, crossfire, and uh, he got shot. <laughs> he got shot in the ass, <laughs> which is funny now, but not funny then, you know. So we joked about it a lot because, you know, we, we, we would ask, you know, say, where the hell were you going? He got shot in the ass. It's like well, you were running in the wrong direction or something. But... It, it wasn't true, it just that so it happened. He got a superficial wound in his buttocks. And uh, so he was laying down, uh, hit. He's, um, he's crying, he's hit. And I was behind some trees or something, and I just reached over and grabbed his legs and pulled him out of the way. It was no big deal. I mean, it was just, you know, just something you would do normally. I mean, just, so I got a bronze medal for that, which was. And the, the funny thing about that was the bronze medal. Uh, there was no big ceremony or anything. They were, I was, you know, on stand down in my bunk something, and they just, you know, threw it. And, you know, hey, you got a bronze medal, buddy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, there was no big ceremonies and you know that kind of stuff. Leading up to the first shots that were fired, do you remember feeling calm, excited, or terrified? Well, you terrif. Well, it, when you're in that situation, when you feel. Yeah, it's a, you don't feel anything. What you feel is adrenaline. I mean, I'm, I'm sure anybody you interview it tells you the same thing. There's no fear. There's nothing. There's just, just first of all, you you want to, you know, make sure you're in the, I mean, you just, safety is the first thing you think about. Uh, and you don't even think about anything. I mean, you don't think about anything. Your adrenaline goes so fast, you hit the ground, your rifle goes over your head. There's none of this John Wayne stuff. That's all BS. Your rifle goes over your head, and you just start shooting in the direction that you know bullets are flying from. Okay, and then you bring your rifle down, change your 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 uh, your clip, put another clip in there, and then you just keep firing in the same direction until somebody says cease fire. Do you recall ever uh, shooting somebody else, one of the enemies? No. All right. Never. Uh, do you ever miss the adrenaline rush that you did get? Well, no that's thanks. not. <laughs> that's not my. People like to jump out of airplanes and get that adrenaline right now. I don't need that. I mean, it's you know, I'll get on a on a roller coaster, and that's 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 all the adrenaline I need. You know, it's not. It's not. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. Do you believe your training paid off? I do believe my training paid off. Yes. Because I had all that extra training, you know. What was the one thing that you learned in training that you think probably helped you out the most? Well, I think was uh, because I was a squad leader, that added to my responsibility, I think, and, and it made me feel that I was responsible for these seven guys. So that training made me feel that I had a duty to do. I wasn't just, you know, I had, I have these seven guys that I'm responsible for and, uh, you know, and uh, um, the whole training about leadership and all that helped me um, just to cope and, and, and to feel that I had something that, that, that I could, you know, that I needed to do. I kept my mind off just to my, just myself. So in other words, um, it wasn't just about me, it was about these other people too. That helped a lot, I think. 
How would you say American weapons compared to the enemy's weapons? <laughs> That's funny because you mentioned that. Um, in those days, I don't know, obviously now, but the, the, our A1, you know, our, uh, uh, I forget, you forgot the name of it, it's been such a long, it's our A1 rifle. Uh, if you dropped it in the mud, then you picked it up and sometimes it would fire and sometimes it wouldn't. So it got, it, it got jammed a lot. Uh, that was our basic weapon, our, you know, our A1 rifle. And, uh, the enemies, AK-47, you can, they would fire on the water almost. It was a very well-made weapon. And their caliber was bigger, too. We had, there was the different, it was a different concept. So we had a small, like an 8 millimeter, I think it was, our little tip. And then we had a lot of gunpowder behind it. So the idea was that the bullet would hit and tumble inside and do more damage or whatever. Whereas the the their caliber was a caliber was a lot bigger, it was a lot heavier, so um, it it didn't it didn't tumble inside of you, but it, it did go through you. Right. So it was just different type of weapons, different. Do you still have contact with any of the people that you served with? Uh, you know, I only had contact with Dennis. His name is Dennis Moore, and M O R I M Moore. R A N Moran Dennis Moran, and I saw him last. Uh, I think it was late seventies. I never saw him again. He, he lived in Michigan. When I was going to Wayne State University in Detroit, I looked him up, and uh, we met. I met his family. We met for. This is the guy. This is another great story. This is the guy that we were out in the field, and uh, he got a box in the mail shoebox from his mother and uh, and I looked over and, and I saw him crying and I then I went over to him and I was still we're talking and he shows me this shoebox with I have two brand new tennis shoes tennis for playing tennis you know the official you know those low-cut tennis shoes from those days and he was crying, uh, you know, out of this laughing and crying at the same time because his, he told his mother that he was stationed in Benoit Air Force Base, that he was just on guard duty all the time, that he never went to the field or whatever, and that he even played tennis every day. So his mother sent a, a pair of tennis shoes to play tennis, you know, and here he is like filthy, head to toe, you know, with a full of mud and full of ringworm or whatever, you know, Mekon Delta, and he, he gets his pristine, beautiful, clean, white little tennis shoes in the mail. Ironic. Did you receive uh, any packages from home? Oh, yeah. A lot of Puerto Rican rum, a lot of Goya products. Goya makes all the Spanish food, you know, Goya beans, Goya, all this Puerto Rican stuff, yeah. I have pictures, like, you know, with uh, two bottles of rum. It's a miracle. My mother did a great job packaging because, you know, bottles of rum, I mean, they, they didn't break. You know, she, and there was, I don't think there was bubble wrap in those days. There was a lot of newspaper or whatever. And, you know, that was great. Did you write home on a regular basis? Yes, I did. Yeah, I wrote my, my wife, of course. I had a wife at the time, so. Did it bother you that there was a lack of support on the, on the, on the war effort back home? That support you mean by the people? By the people, yeah. Well, you know, with... It was, the problem with that to me was the, the lack of understanding because, you know, these guys, most of the guys were drafted. You know, they had, you know, they didn't want to be there, you know. So the least you could do, you know, that's, that's and I think that was the lesson for the country, our country, uh, uh, the Vietnam War, it was the fact that that war was so, you know, to us and to the American people was so shameful that we even, you know, we despised our own soldiers because of that, which they had really nothing to do with it. They were just pawns in the middle of this war game, you know what I'm saying? 
and then they got treated like crap when they got, you know, all, not all of them, but a lot of them got treated like crap, and we got treated like crap when we got back. Whereas I think that's been corrected, and now, you know, that's where you see a lot of support our troops, whatever, you know, things, which is great. I mean, I'm totally against the Afghanistan war, and I'm totally against the, the Iraqi thing and the whole nine years, that I think it was the stupidest thing that we ever did. But I'm totally, in, you know, pro my, our soldiers, you know, because they, they are, again, they are just victims. They are the victims of the, of the war. They're, of, they're victims of politicians. They're victims of, you know, of, of, of you know, of, of the greed. They're victims of whatever. But, you know, it's not their fault. They're getting shot at or placed in harm's way. You know, I mean, they're doing their job. And that's what they're supposed to do. And that's what they're trained to do. And that's, that's totally beside the point. So that's the difference between the two wars. Big difference. Coming close to the end of your time in Vietnam, what were some of your aspirations and plans for when you returned home? I was going to do something with my life, which I did. As soon as I got out of the, you know, Vietnam and I got home and, you know, and I, I got out of the, of the service, I started going to school at night to finish high school. And then as soon as I finished my high school diploma, I got my diploma, I started uh, uh, taking whatever exams, whatever I needed to get into college, and I did that. And I was, you know, I never thought I was college material, but, you know, I did it, and uh, and I went to college at night. I started going to college at night in Puerto Rico. And my sister went to college in Detroit, and that's how I wound up in Detroit, because I wanted to be a, a, an artist, too, a designer and an artist. And so I wanted to get a Bachelor of Fine Arts, and, you know, I transferred to to Wayne State University, and I, I did it. When and where were you discharged from service? Um, I was discharged uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia. What was the return home like? Oh, my God, it was great. You know, Well, it might have been great as a return home from Vietnam, obviously. You know, the plane going back, remember the somber coming, going back, that was a different ball game. There was a huge part, and obviously they had no alcohol, because can you imagine? Uh, a plane full of soldiers coming back from the war, no alcohol, buddy, because you know they would they would torn up the whole freaking airplane. <laughs> but you know when we got back, uh, uh, you know it was just it was just you know. As soon as we got on that, actually, as soon as I got my orders that I was going home, and left the fire base in Tanan and got to Benoit, it was party time, you know. You know, my friends and I, we were just a, one huge party until we got home, you know. And then, you know, when then they give you all this, it was, you know, the Army likes to, what they say, mess with you, you know. So the, when we were in Vietnam, uh, they used to, used to leave in fatigues and then get your clothes in the United States. No. They gave us some, because we're in Vietnam, summer clothes, summer uniforms, you know, khakis. So we got khakis and then when we got back to the United States it was winter. So then they messed with us they, with you again. They're telling you, okay, uh, no, you can't go home in khakis because it's, it's not summertime. You need winter clothes now. So then we had to change our, then they had to re, give us new clothes, winter, you know, uniform to go back home. So that delayed a couple of days. They're just messing with you, you know. Like the latest, a couple of days from getting home, and everybody's like really pissed. Yeah. So then finally we got our winter clothes, and then we can go home. And then when I went back home. What was the first thing you did when you returned home? Uh, actually, this is more interesting, a little more interesting than just because I already had the experience of coming back. This was when I went to R and R, went to R and R in in uh, in, uh, in Hawaii. All my buddies were going, they were, you know, they were bachelors, so they were going, you know, Taiwan or Japan or Singapore or, or whatever, and, you know, having a ball there because they were bachelors. But I was married, so I went to Hawaii to meet up with my wife. That was another, another total experience. So the first thing I did when I got home to, when I got to the hotel with her was flush the toilet. <laughs> and she thought I was crazy. I was like, 
Kardashian. I said, I looked at her and I said, you don't know how beautiful this thing is. <laughs> that was a funny thing. She's going like, oh, man, <laughs> he's whacked out. So, but when I came back from Vietnam, you know, permanently, then, you know, it was a whole different ballgame. Um, there was, there was, you know, probably one of the happiest times that you could ever be. You're out of the war, and you're alive without a scratch in my case, you know. I was, I was really lucky. Very, very lucky. How do you think your uh, family and peers viewed you after your service? Um, excuse me? How do you think that your family and your peers viewed you after your service? Well, Puerto Rico, um, uh, you know, they were just happy to, you know, to know that I was home and safe. I mean, it was just one huge party after another, you know. Uh, nobody ever, you know, said anything like, you look different, you, look, you know, you, you, you're whacked out or something, because I didn't, I didn't feel that way. So, you know, it was just... Um, I got back to my life with my friends and my family and and my wife and you know started working you know that kind of stuff and you know, just kind of eased into like except with the exception of you know hearing fireworks and going you know but, but I didn't have that bad a time getting adjusted back to the real life real world that was a lot easier than adjusting to the military world. Um. You were, you say you've mentioned a lot of the the medals and stuff that you've received. Mm -hmm. Which one would you say you're the most proud of? Well, probably the bronze star, sure. Yeah. What was the highest rank that you received? Uh, Buck sergeant, three stripes, E five. Looking back now, what is your feeling towards the Vietnam conflict? Well, like I mentioned before, I thought it was a total waste. Fifty five, fifty eight thousand dead young Americans for nothing. That's what I feel. It was absolutely worthless. Nothing. Nothing was gained. Nothing was won. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Was, I, when I went to the, I had the experience of going to the wall in, in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, I, I cried like a baby because I just, you know, I just couldn't believe, you know, the number of names on there for nothing, absolutely nothing. It's, it's just infuriating, you know, that we could be, our country and our leaders could be so damn stupid to, you know, to, you know, to stop the communists over there before they get over here. Give me a freaking break. The same thing with all this Iraqi stuff, you know. It's the same mantra again, the same exact mantra that was during the Vietnam War. Well, we'll stop the terrorists over there before they get over here. That's bullshit. Pardon me. It really pisses me off. You know. Have you ever wanted to return to Vietnam? Yes, I would love to go back. What do you to, think to, you would do if you did go back? I'd like to visit the places that I were that I really didn't enjoy because I was, you know, dodging bullets. <laughs> but, I mean, I wanted, you know, like, I never went to Saigon. I never got to go to Saigon because I was a combat soldier. And anybody that had a combat patch, you know, they, they wouldn't let them go to Saigon. Only, only support people can go to Saigon. Could you talk a little bit about your profession now and the path that you took to get to where you're at now after college and how you ended up at Ball State and... Yeah, I um, I went to, uh, like I said, after I got out of Vietnam, I went to college in Puerto Rico uh, for a couple of years, and I worked, and, and then I transferred to Wayne State University because I had a sister there. And at Wayne State, I uh, I got my degree, a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, and I, uh, I, had, I got married to my first wife, and I had children there, and then... Uh, I got laid off from my job that I was working on, uh, and uh, I was looking for a job, and I found a job uh, teaching at Ivy Tech in South Bend. The requirement was a bachelor's degree in fine art. They didn't even want a bachelor's degree in graphic design, even though it was a graphic design job. And they wanted you to have five years' experience as a graphic designer, which I had even more than that, because even though I had a degree in 
fine arts, I always worked as a graphic designer in Puerto Rico. And while well, I was in college in Wayne State University, I worked as a graphic designer in an advertising agency. Uh, because I grew up around graphic design. My father was a graphic designer and all that, um, an illustrator. So I got the job teaching at Ivy Tech. So then I went to Notre Dame while I was there and got my terminal degree and my MFA in, in, in fine arts. And then uh, I got a job, and then uh, the chairperson of the art department at that time at Ball State was a good friend of the chairperson of the um, graph design program at Ivy Tech where I worked. And uh, he, he, saw, he knew about my work and he, there was an opening here and he asked me to apply to the program to, you know, as a professor. So I got the job here. I applied and interviewed, got the job, and I've been here ever since, 1985. Well, that's really all about, about all I have. I'd like to give you this time to touch on anything I left out or didn't uh, follow up on. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, there, the fact that, you know, the, we, what we talked about earlier, you know that the whole Vietnam experience to me was, it it, it was a terrible experience, of course. But I tried to make the best experience out of it, and that's sort of a lesson for anybody in any situation. You know what I mean? I mean, you, the the worst thing that you can be in is a war, and if you can make something positive out of it, and everybody has their Vietnam. Let's put it that way. I mean, everybody in the world has some kind of terrible thing that happens to them in their life or some terrible situation or they lose you know, somebody they love or they, you know, whatever it is. And I, you know, and I've had students and family members and then when they're going through this, I say, that's your Vietnam, you know. That's, you know, my, even my children, my, my, you know, my offspring. I said, you know, think of that as your Vietnam and make something positive. Out of it, and if you can do that, then you you know you will always come, you know, up on the positive side of things. Um, and I think that's what happened to my cousin and other soldiers that you know, they can never get over that hump, and uh, their then their life was uh, unfortunately turned out pretty bad because of that. All right. Well, I would like to thank you for your time here today.